Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we have our internet uh, back up and running. And so uh, hopefully you've been patient to stick around, even though we're starting uh, just about eight or so minutes late. So uh, good evening to everyone that has joined us, um, or if you're watching this later on, welcome. And uh, we're going to be studying Jeremiah chapter 13 tonight. So if you will open your Bible to that chapter in Jeremiah, and we are continuing our uh, marathon study, I guess, through the book of Jeremiah. We did this a couple of years ago with Isaiah, uh, and you know it's one of those projects that you have to stay consistent, and if you do, uh, I think there's just so much to be gathered from these uh, just wonderfully rich books of the uh, major prophets, as we call them that. Uh, we call them major prophets because they're longer than the other books of the prophets. Uh, but there's so much material in a book like Isaiah or Jeremiah, and oftentimes it is the length of the book that causes us to maybe shy away from it. Uh, but um, there's so much there. I mean, Jeremiah is by word count the longest book in the Bible. And so uh, there's a lot of material for us to gain and a lot that we miss if we don't know the book uh, very well. And so hopefully uh, we are together staying consistent in our own reading and in uh, right now the viewing and then hopefully later on the attending of these classes so that the, uh, the knowledge that we're gaining from the book of Jeremiah can stick. Speaking of that, uh, we did a fairly extensive review of the first 12 chapters uh, after uh, Sunday's class, or th in the second half of Sunday's class. And so we will not begin with another review uh, before we jump into chapter 13. Um, but I will talk a little bit about the structure of the book, because at least according to one of the outlines that we are using, we are starting a new section. So. We've talked about this before, and then we've referred to it a bunch of times in passing. And so I just want to talk in a little more detail again about the structure of the book of Jeremiah. Um, in one more basic way of structuring the book, this is what you have. You have a big section at the beginning of the book from chapters 1 to 25 in which we have oracles, that is messages. You could think of these as uh, maybe sermons um, kind of compiled together. Uh, that Jeremiah has given over the course of his ministry in Judah and Jerusalem. And these are put together in the first 25 chapters. And when you read them, you see Jeremiah, uh, uh, the words that Jeremiah has been given to speak, the messages that he's been given by God to pronounce against Judah. At the end of the book, there will be a similar connect, uh, collection of sermons or oracles but this time they will not be uh, specifically for Judah and Jerusalem, but they will be for the other nations and kind of zero in specifically on Babylon, um, who is the nation that has taken Judah into captivity in the, time of uh, in the time of Jeremiah. So we begin with a large section of oracles against Judah. We're going to close the book with a large section of oracles against the nations. And then after our sermons in the first 25 chapters, we're going to have an interlude, kind of a break, where we have more historical information or, or uh, stories given to us. Maybe that's the best word to use here, stories. And so when you get to chapter 26, you're going to notice that we're, it's like you're back reading the books of Kings, uh, where it's a story told to us about the things taking place in the time of Jeremiah. And there's another section very similar to this uh, later on in the book, from chapters 34 to 45, and then right in the middle, and this is kind of the, the key uh, in terms of understanding the outline of the book, is that oftentimes the, the key section is in the middle, and the book of Jeremiah, that is chapters 30 to 33. They will read much like those oracles or prophecies. That's the same style. These are messages given by Jeremiah. But in this middle and central section of the book, these are messages of, of hope, of the coming uh, restoration that God will bring, the new covenant that he is looking forward to, so on and so forth. Okay, that's just the way the book is structured, I think, with messages of condemnation and disaster. Okay, uh, the, how Israel has rebelled and the judgment that's going to come upon them or is coming upon them from the Lord. And this uh, parallels with those oracles of judgment against the nations that we have already talked about at the end of the book. But um, after chapter 12, you can break it out a little bit more specifically and see that in chapters 13 to 20, 
There are uh, maybe more specifically uh, uh, more talk about exile, the pending exile and God's plans for that exile. And in this section, we're going to start to see more, although we've seen some already, more of uh, uh, Jeremiah specifically and his response to uh, this, uh, this difficult work of preaching the, the word of God. And we're going to see more of those conversations that he has with God. Um, and so uh, we want to pay attention to that. And that kind of is paralleled by some of these stories later on um, in chapters 36 to 45, stories about Jeremiah's suffering. So that's the parallel here is that 13 to 20, we get the complaints of Jeremiah. 36 to 45, we see the stories told about the things that are happening to him and causing his suffering. Okay. Then we're going to have a section, uh, again, this outline is labeled it as addressing kings and others. So we're fudging a little bit on that. But that parallels with some stories where Jeremiah is bringing direct messages to the king in Judah in chapters 34 and 35. And then again, the centerpiece of the book uh, in this outline as well is that section of, of hope or of comfort from 30 to 33. Okay, so... According to this outline, we are moving tonight from 12 to 13. We are moving into a new section. And um, again, we're talking, uh, we're going to be seeing more about exile. We're going to be talking uh, even more about Jeremiah and his role in all of this. And speaking of Jeremiah, one of the things that happens in this section uh, in particular that we haven't seen yet is this idea of the sign act. And that is something that uh, Jeremiah will be given to do, to act out. Um, and that acting out, uh, pantomiming, so to speak, will be a way of communicating the message in a different way to the people to maybe get them to pay attention. So let's talk a little bit about that because that, that is something that's fairly common in the books of the prophets, in the stories of the prophets. What this is, is, is that God would give them something to act out. Uh, in order to get the people to pay attention. Uh, this still happens today. Um, that uh, I, I was thinking about this and preparing, and there are a few sermons that I have, have witnessed, have seen, heard in my life that I will never forget uh, because the speaker used some sort of prop or he acted out something uh, in a way that, that, you know, whatever the point was, and I usually remember what the point is, uh, that's better than, than remembering the illustration without the point. Uh, but for instance, I remember uh, Ralph Walker, who I think has uh, spoken here in meetings before. I was telling someone about this uh, recently. I think it might have been Jim. Uh, I heard him speak at Kleinwood, and he had three chairs on the stage. And he was, as he was describing this principle of what happens from one generation to the next generation to the next generation, he was placing these chairs on the stage in order uh, to represent the first generation, the second generation, the third generation. Um, and I, I won't forget that because of the prop that he used. I recently actually was in Atlanta and the preacher was making a point about um, uh, how the, the outward appearance is not what matters, right? And we can too easily get in this, you know, uh, where we're trying to just look good on the outside and impress other people and, and, and uh, you know, lose the heart of what we're doing. And so right there in the middle of the sermon on the stage, he, he ripped his coat off and threw it to the side and he took his tie off and threw it to the side. And uh, yeah, I, I won't forget that. Um, and because when you see something acted out, it, it, it sticks with you. You see a prop. Uh, there's something about that that sticks. So it could be that God, uh, in these instances, and, and think about it maybe especially in Jeremiah, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's to, to um, when the people have gotten to a point where they're just not listening anymore, this is just another attempt to get their attention and to get them to listen to what's going on. But some of these you may remember from other prophets. I may remember from our study of Isaiah. I have not seen this in a sermon before. Uh, but he walked around naked uh, to predict how Egypt and Cush would go into Assyrian exile. Uh, you may remember that Ezekiel had to lie on his side for like hundreds of days um, in order to symbolize the amount of years that Israel, Israel had been committing, committing this iniquity against God. Um, and then maybe most kind of serious and sobering, uh, maybe remember that Hosea was instructed to marry a prostitute um, and to have children by her and then to go back later when she uh, was unfaithful to him and redeem her 
uh, from her slavery um, in order to, to symbolize, to demonstrate the relationship that God had with his people Israel. Okay, so this is the idea, and we're going to see several of them in Jeremiah, and the first one comes tonight uh, in uh, chapter 13. Um, Alex, I put the, the handouts on, that, um, on the table, on the chair back there. Sorry, there they are. You guys got them. Okay. Our technical uh, crew wanting to follow along, so instructing them where the, uh, where the handouts are. But let's get into Jeremiah chapter 13 and notice this sign act. So the first thing we'll read, the first 11 verses of Jeremiah chapter 13. Thus the Lord said to me, Go and buy yourself a linen waistband and put it around your waist, but do not put it in water. So I bought, so I bought the waistband in accordance with the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, Take the waistband that you have bought, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates and hide it there in the crevice of a rock. So I went and hid it in the Euphrates, as the Lord had commanded me. And after many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the waistband which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug, and I took the waistband from the place where I had hidden it. And lo, the waistband was ruined. It was totally worthless. Verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, Just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This wicked people who refuse to listen to my words will walk in the stubbornness of their hearts and have gone after other gods to serve them and bow down to them. Let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. For as the waistband clings to the waist of a man, so I made the household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they, may, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory. But they did not listen. Okay, this is the first sign act in the book that Jeremiah is told to uh, enact. And uh, what he does is he is told to go buy a waistband. Um, there's some discussion about what exactly this would be. Um, th this uh, could be an outer garment worn around the waist. Uh, it could be a more uh, inner garment. In fact, maybe even, uh, it's, uh, I think, probable that this is the closest garment you would wear to the body around the waist. Loincloth may actually be a translation you have in your Bible. Uh, but he's supposed to buy this and to wear it without putting it in water. I think the idea is to not wash it first. And uh, then once he's worn it for a while, unwashed, then he's supposed to take it to the Euphrates. Uh, some discussion about this too. It's possible that this is a, uh, a body of water, a stream um, in and around where Jeremiah would have lived in the, in the land of Benjamin. Um, but obviously it could be the Euphrates that we're familiar with, um, which is, you know, Tigris and the Euphrates in Mesopotamia, which would be kind of the, the border or the, uh, the land of Babylon. Okay, uh, supposed to go hide it there. And then after a while, he says, many days, go and find it again. And once he digs it up uh, under, from under the rock or under the dirt, that loincloth, that waistband, um, as you would expect, has been totally ruined and it is totally worthless. Okay, uh, which again is no surprise. So what in the world is this sign act all about? Well, God explains to Jeremiah in verses 8 through 11 that this uh, dirty underwear, this soiled loincloth, this uh, worthless, um, uh, ruined piece of uh, clothing was the story of Judah herself, the story of Jerusalem. And much of this is, is explained by God. And just, just notice the parallels in these verses between uh, the, the uh, waistband and the people of Judah. He says they were made to cling to me in verse 11. So I made the whole household. It says, as the waistband clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole household of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord. This word for cling uh, here in this verse is actually the same word that's used in Genesis 2.24 
speaking of Adam and Eve, when it says that for this reason a man should leave his father and, and mother and hold fast or cleave. Remember the old uh, translation say, leave and cleave. That cleave word of joining to his wife in Genesis 2, that's the word that God uses here to say that he made Judah to cling to him as this garment would cling to a man. This is a picture of closeness, of intimacy. This is what we've seen before in the book of Jeremiah, what God wanted for his people, but instead they have become defiled. They have become dirty. They have become soiled and they have refused to be washed. Okay. Um, and in doing that, the language we've seen before, the walking in the stubbornness of their heart and walking after other gods, they have become uh, defiled, they have become ruined, and they have become worthless. Uh, in fact, the, the word in verse 9, just so I will destroy the pride of Judah, is the very same word used in verse 7 when it says that the waistband was ruined. Uh, we've seen the, the other descriptions of this, but uh, it is clear that Judah and Jerusalem have come to ruin, to desolation, uh, and they are worthless because of their corruption. But this is not stated explicitly, but I wonder if uh, and would surmise that this is part of the sign act. Think about where Jeremiah took this and then what he ended up doing, that this waistband was taken to the Euphrates and then he went and brought it back again. And I wonder if the point of this sign act, the kind of implicit point that's left uh, unsaid, is that just as the waistband was taken to the Euphrates, the people of Judah and Jerusalem will be taken beyond the Euphrates into captivity, but that they'll be brought back. Maybe that's implicit in this as well, that like that uh, piece of dirty underwear, they will also be brought back again. And again, we've seen that uh, alluded to and, and, and said in the book of Jeremiah so far, and we'll see more of it, that there is a return that is being uh, prophesied after the exile. Okay, so that's the sign act. We'll see other, other ones of these in Jeremiah, uh, but the ruined waistband is probably one that hopefully will, will stick in our minds and we'll remember the point of, uh, of what it is that Judah has become and what God will do or is doing with her in the days of Jeremiah. Okay, let's keep going here to uh, verse 12 of chapter 13. And read on to verse 19. Therefore, you are to speak this word to them. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Every jug is to be filled with wine. And when they say to you, do we not very well know that every jug is to be filled with wine? Then say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I am about to fill all the inhabitants of this land. The kings that sit for David on his throne, the priests the prophets, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. I will dash them against each other, both the fathers and the sons together, declares the Lord. I will not show pity, nor be sorry, nor have compassion, so as not to destroy them. Listen and give heed. Do not be haughty, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness and before your feet stumble on the dusky mountains. And while you're hoping for light, he makes it into deep darkness and turns it into gloom. But if you will not listen to it, my soul will sob in secret for such pride, and my eyes will bitterly weep and flow down with tears because the flock of the Lord has been taken captive. Say to the king and queen mother, take a lowly seat, for your beautiful crown has come down from your head. The cities of the Negev have been locked up. And there is no one to open them. All Judah has been carried into exile, wholly carried into exile. Okay, we have another uh, symbol here. This is not so much a sign act because uh, it, it, Jeremiah is not instructed to, you know, act this out, so to speak. But he is told to tell the people, hey, every jug should be filled with wine. Now, uh, most likely what's, what's happening here is that the word jug is like the word that is used for what you put wine in. So maybe, you know, we would say every wine bottle should be filled with wine. And that's why they get the, uh, the uh, response, Jeremiah gets the response, well, what else would we do, right? We know that you put wine in wine bottles. So why are you telling us that uh, every jug, every wine jug should be filled with wine? That seems obvious. But 
The point is that God is bringing his wrath upon Judah and Jerusalem. And the symbol that's used for that, the imagery that's used for that, is, the, is drunkenness. Okay? This is actually a fairly common thing in the prophets. In Isaiah 51 and 17, if I can get there relatively quickly, I can just go ahead and read it for you. Um, and uh, it says, Rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs. And then again in Jeremiah 25, we'll see this later on in verses 15 and 16. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel says to me, take this cup of the wine of the wrath from my hand and cause all the nations uh, to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. So you see the picture here. God's wrath is pictured as a cup that when people drink it, they reel and they stagger and they are destroyed by this. And it's, it, it's, it's pictured as someone getting so drunk or, or maybe uh, a group of people getting so drunk that, that, that they just destroy and consume one another. And that's the picture given here in Jeremiah chapter 13, okay? That he will fill all the inhabitants of the land. And notice again, we see this group focused on the kings and the priests and the prophets. Those groups have been singled out quite a bit in Jeremiah, but he adds on to that and all the inhabitants of uh, Judah and Jerusalem. Um, and uh, they will receive this wrath and they will uh, destroy one another. So uh, I don't know if the picture here is one of just a, a, a drunken brawl that breaks out. Uh, or again, you see, it's that imagery from other passages of the reeling and staggering and coming to ruin because God's wrath has been poured out upon them. Um, and they will um, not receive, in verse 14, the pity or the compassion of God as he has given them over to destruction. Fairly common in the Bible that pride and, and drunkenness are connected, and so maybe it wouldn't surprise us that the, uh, the force of the message from 15 to 19 is this idea of pride. And so uh, the people are told, and this seems to be Jeremiah's words in 15 and on, where he says, you know, listen, listen, don't you see what God is, is doing and what you are doing to bring this upon yourselves? Just listen, stop being so haughty, so arrogant. Uh, that stubbornness is, is a result of the prideful heart that is intent on their own way. Is give glory to God. Humble yourself. Stop being so arrogant. But uh, Jeremiah knows and I think sees that they are continuing in the stubbornness of their heart. And so again, we see in verse 17, he says, If you will not listen, my soul will sob. My eyes will weep bitterly. And flow with tears because of the captivity that has come upon the people. Okay, so uh, God's wrath is being poured upon him. And Jeremiah is calling for them to humble themselves and to give glory to God. Uh, specifically, and this would make sense, the call for humbling oneself, for submitting oneself, is taken all the way to the top of that rung of uh, the top rung of the ladder of pride, so to speak, to the king and the queen mother. Uh, I was, I was uh, listening to someone talk about this, and it was kind of new for me. Uh, they made the point that um, when you read through the kings, in almost every circumstance, or at least in, in many of the circumstances, when the king is introduced, it will, it will name who the mother of the king is. And uh, it seems to be that the queen mother, for whatever reason this came about, uh, in Judah... Um, the queen mother, that is the mother of the, of the, the reigning king, uh, had a prominent position. In fact, this may be uh, some explanation to why Athaliah, who we talked about in our review, remember she's, uh, she's the queen that actually, you know, kills all of her children and grandchildren, at least tries to, in order to take power for herself. So maybe that's an example of that kind of custom that, it, that has gone, uh, gone wrong, gone to the extreme uh, in Athaliah's case. Uh, but anyway, this verse seems to, to, to point out the queen mother has some role of prominence. And so addressing both the king and the queen mother, humble yourself, right? Take a lowly seat, sit down. Because in this instance, it seems to be a forced humbling of yourself. Uh, take a seat because your crown is being removed 
from your head. Uh, that's what we're seeing in, in Jeremiah. We saw that as we reviewed the end of the book of 2 Kings, that these, uh, these sons of Josiah uh, will you know, just reign very shortly, and they're coming in. You remember, Egypt will come in and depose one to set up another, and then Babylon will come in to depose one and set up the other, and then eventually the king himself is carried off, uh, and uh, the, the, the crown, the, the, the throne of David um, is left empty because the king has been dethroned. And that's what Jeremiah is saying here. Um, and so, again, you can see that idea of humble yourself. Um, and then you see God humbling the king by uh, bowing him low and taking his crown. And the end result of that, of course, will be exile. Uh, he mentions the Negev here in verse 19. And uh, the Negev is the farthest southern region of Judah. And so think about it. Remember that the uh, de destruct destruction, the attackers, uh, which we'll see even in verse 20, repeated again, uh, they come from the north. That's where the Babylonians attack from. So if the cities in the farthest south are already under siege or already uh, taken, then that's just a picture of the whole land, right? Um, I hope we, we never are invaded by Canada, but if you heard a report that said, you know, Canada is invaded and McAllen, Texas has been, you know, overthrown by the, you would say, well, then the whole country's lost. They've gone uh, as far as they can go. And so that's the picture here is that the cities in the Negev are taken. And so all uh, of Judah, he says, has been carried into exile, wholly carried into exile, uh, emphasizing the point that's made there. Okay, and then we're going to finish up with the last uh, eight or so verses of Jeremiah 13. And so read with me in verses 20 to 27. Lift up your eyes and see those coming from the north. Where is the flock that was given you, your beautiful sheep? What will you say when he appoints over you and you yourself had taught them former companions to be head over you? Will not pangs take hold of you like a woman in childbirth? If you say in your heart, why have these things happened to me? Because of the magnitude of your iniquity. Your skirts have been removed and your heels have been exposed. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also can do evil, sorry, can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Therefore, I will scatter them like drifting straw to the desert wind. This is your lot the portion measured to you from me, declares the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. So I myself have also stripped your skirts over your face that your shame may be seen. As for your adulteries and your lustful names, the lewdness of your prostitution on the hills of the, in the field, I have seen your abominations. Woe to you, O Jerusalem. How long will you remain unclean? Okay, it could be that, that, that there's still somewhat of, of an address to the king, or that still may be in view here. Um, but he mentions again the destruction coming from the north, and I'll just remind you one more time uh, of that boiling pot of chapter 1. And that was the picture that encapsulated Jeremiah's message, the pot tipping over from the north and the destruction coming down into Judah and Jerusalem as the Babylonians attack. Um, but notice that the destruction comes, and he says, where is your flock, the beautiful sheep? That's uh, part of makes me think that maybe the king is still uh, being addressed here. Maybe the king is representative of the whole nation because he was the shepherd watching over the sheep. And so the question is, what's happened, uh, O shepherd, to your sheep uh, that are so precious to you? And of course, the kind of answer to that rhetorical question is that the, the, the invaders have come from the north. The cities have been locked up. The people have been uh, taken away. And so uh, this is, again, a picture of that exile. But notice he says, it's a little bit confusing. He says, what, what will you say when, when these come in who used to be your companions and now they are appointed over you? Now they are your head. Um, it's hard to tell, but it could be that what's in view here is that story um, that's told to us in the book of Kings and in Isaiah chapter 39 when Hezekiah, and so again, if this is, especially if this is addressed to the king, see, remember what you did, kind of the, the office of king had done. Remember when Hezekiah had invited the Babylonians in to see the treasuries of Jerusalem. And likely what's going on there is that Hezekiah is making 
um, one of these alliances that the kings of Judah and Israel were so fond of making. And they were, he, was, he was saying, hey, look, you know, this is what I can bring to this relationship if we kind of form an alliance here. All this uh, you know, treasury that, that we have here. And now, those friends that Hezekiah made, the Babylonians, and Hezekiah was told this by Isaiah uh, after that happened in his lifetime. Those same companions now have come in to be uh, their destroyers or to subjugate them. And that's, that's so common throughout. In fact, we'll, we'll mention maybe an allusion to this uh, in these same verses we read. So common that the very people that Israel and Judah reached out to for help in these other nations were the very ones that, that oftentimes ended up being their oppressors or being their subjugators. Again, we'll notice that. Uh, the language maybe of that in just a minute. But now in this case, verse 21, he says, this is like the pains of childbirth. Um, obviously, not, not that I can speak from personal experience, uh, but this is a very painful thing. So just the pain itself could be what's in view. But in light of what he's just said, it could be that the idea is that this has been coming for a while, right? It's like, uh, you know, the seed uh, was planted, so to speak. And so now uh, this has kind of grown to its fulfillment. And now the birth pangs are coming upon Judah and Jerusalem for things that have been happening for generations and generations, all the way back maybe even to Hezekiah and the showing of the treasury, the making of the alliance with the Babylonians. Now it's come to pass and the pains are upon you like the pains of childbirth. Okay. Um, in verse 22, he says, if you say in your heart, why have these things happened to me? And again, as the reader of the book, you think, well, you know, why? That's a stupid question. It's so obvious why this is happening to you. Uh, but we tend to be that way too, that even uh, when we're the ones in the situation, we think, well, why is this happening to me? It's often harder to see when you're the one at fault. Uh, but the answer is clear. Because of the magnitude of your iniquity, you have brought this uh, shame. There's a lot of language in these verses here. I don't really even know what all to say about it, but just even just reading it, it's idea of, you know, your skirts have been removed and your heels have been exposed. I mean, this is, this is the, uh, the picture of humiliation, uh, of exposing, undressing for the putting to shame, uh, to, to expose what they are and to humiliate them for their abominations. Um, he said, this is what you've done. Because of the magnitude of your iniquity, all this has come upon you. Verse 23, the point uh, being made, he says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? For uh, these people who would have had, I think, relatively dark skin themselves, uh, someone from Ethiopia or from uh, the continent of Africa, uh, that, that to them would have been the darkest skin that they uh, had seen. And so, you know, can, can a person with dark skin just change their skin color? Uh, can a leopard change its spots? And the, of course, the answer is no. And so the point is, neither can these people do good. He's saying, you can do good about as easily as a person can change their skin color. Or you can do good about as easily as a leopard can change their spots. This, this, they have grown accustomed to doing evil. That's become ingrained in them. It's become second nature. Um, and so these abominations that have become their nature are the reason for their, now their shame and humiliation. And again, it's such a natural consequence. As they have turned to adulteries, as they have turned to these uh, abominations, the language he's used before, their, their lewdness, their prostitution, uh, again, mostly in a metaphorical sense, but we've seen that sexual sin is also a part of what's being condemned. He says, I have seen these abominations, verse 27, uh, woe to you, O Jerusalem, how long will you remain unclean? It's uh, I don't know if this is intentional, but that uh, how long will you remain unclean just takes us back to that image of the waistband that has been ruined. How long will you refuse to be washed? And this is the situation that the people are in. Having brought this ruin and destruction upon themselves, having brought shame and humiliation upon themselves because of their adultery. And he says in here in verse 25, because... They have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. By the way, this is, this is similar to that construction of they have forsaken me, the fountains of living water, and hewed out for themselves uh, broken cisterns, right? They have forgotten me, he says, and they have turned to fall. They have trusted in falsehood. Uh, could be a couple things are in view here. Could, I think the two things would be 
Um, they've trusted in other nations. We've already talked about that, right? They've looked to Egypt to, to help them when they're in crisis. They've looked to Babylon when they're in crisis. They've looked to Syria, Assyria. They've looked to all these uh, uh, nations to, to bail them out, to help them with political alliances. And again, that leads always to their ruin, right? Trusting in falsehood, trusting in something that can't help you, or in these idols, trusting in false gods, trusting in Baal uh, to, to send the rain and to, uh, to, to help them, give them life, or trusting to Molech, and the ch child sacrifices will bring some blessing to them. And again, as we kind of close here, um, th this is the same thing that, that we do, okay? And again, they've forgotten God and trusted in falsehood. How many times when the crisis comes up in life, when, when we're faced with some kind of problem, we just forget the Lord? And what should be the first thought when you, when you recognize I'm in trouble, okay? I got a problem here. There's something in my life that isn't right. Or I'm being faced with, with uh, hostility or I'm being faced with uh, some kind of suffering, some kind of tragedy or crisis has come up, okay? And the pretty maybe obvious answer should be turn to the Lord. Trust in him and seek him out and, and pray and, and lean on him and lean on his people, okay? But so often those are the, the solutions that are farthest from us. And we think of all of the, uh, you know, the idols that we can keep worshiping, okay? Um, or we think of the, uh, the, the things of the world, the nation, so to speak, in this case, uh, that we can trust in and turn to. And so we start looking to, you know, the experts and, and the, the books that they write and how we can uh, you know, uh, get their advice, and maybe we go to friends and, and seek their advice, and all this stuff. We go to every other other thing, except for the Lord. Um, and the more we trust in these things that cannot save us, the more uh, our our ruin and our um, our problems will only compound upon themselves. Okay, so they have forgotten me, God says, and trusted in falsehood, and that's why all of this has come upon them. Okay, well, we'll quit there. Uh, we've gone, uh, including the delay, it's been, we've gone about 45 minutes here. And so we will quit. And uh, we are going to try to cover a little bit more than one chapter in our next class. So if you're going to read ahead, I would read all of chapter 14 and the uh, maybe first half or so of chapter 15. And that is where we'll pick up on Sunday. Uh, again, sorry for the, uh, the, the difficulty um, you know, would you know, 728, the internet just zapped, went out just like that, as you know, happens from time to time. So, um, thank you for being patient, sticking with us and, uh, joining us in our study of Jeremiah and, uh, we will sign off and, uh, see you again on Sunday at 930 for our worship. Thank you.